Hello everyone, bringing you a video today talking about the British 1958 Patent Web Equipment. Now, this is something I've talked about in various different contexts on the channel previously. The idea of this video is to give a sort of timeline, a, a run through of this, an overview of its service life. It was in use from 19, well, very late 1950s, really the 1960s, right the way through into the 1990s, when of course it was progressively replaced with the new PLCE, Nylon Web Equipment. So it's the, the Web equipment that spanned the greatest period of service in British use during the Cold War. Up until that point, of course, the 1937 pattern had been in use with the 1944 pattern web equipment mixed in, generally for use out in the Far East. So the 1958 pattern, a little bit of background to it, introduced, as I said, in the very, very late 1950s and really became more prevalent in the 1960s. Obviously, it replaced the 1937 pattern initially for infantry and then for supporting arms and so forth. There's always a transitional period when web equipment changes over from you know, the preceding pattern to the newer pattern. And obviously, infantry tend to, you know, the teeth arms of the army, as it were, tend to be prioritised in terms of the new issue. As introduced, 1958 pattern was the first standard issue, dyed green, subdued metal fittings, web equipment, introduced into the British Army. The 1944 pattern had these features, much as it was made general issue in terms of it could be issued out to troops more generally post Second World War in 1946. It was nevertheless really restricted to issue in the Far East and some specific unit issue as well. So 1958 pattern, the first up-to-date modern web equipment for the British Army in the Cold War, which was standard issue. Really designed for armoured infantry, in the late 1950s and into the 1960s, there was definitely the thinking that any future battlefield was going to probably end up being a nuclear battlefield, so infantry were going to have to be armoured. And what we're going to be looking at in the video is different sets of the equipment set up in combat equipment fighting order, which is to say deleting the pack. Now, the pack didn't really change in form through the period. The various fixtures and fittings did, but the pack itself and the way it's attached to the equipment didn't. The pack really seems to have been an afterthought in that it just had straps that went over the shoulders of the, the yoke here, hooked into these D-rings with little hooks, and then had supporting straps that hooked into the loops on top of the ammunition pouches here. So it didn't have its own carrying straps. It, it was used. Uh, it, it seems that certainly at its inception it was designed primarily for changing stations, much as the pack, the preceding 1908 pack, had been intended for use with 1937 pattern for changing stations. 1937 pattern, you were generally supposed to carry the smaller haversack on the back. In this equipment, as we'll see as we move it around, that load carrying capacity has been replaced with the rear pouches. And this is really how the equipment was supposed to be worn in the field. The pack was really for on the march and changing stations, that sort of thing. And it seems to have been a bit of an afterthought, really, certainly in the way it attaches to the equipment. So what we're going to be looking at, as I say, is combat equipment fighting order, how it was intended to be used, and when the equipment finally did see major service uh, in the Gulf War, which is the last mannequin we're going to be looking at. The men were obviously deployed as armoured infantry and generally wore the equipment in combat equipment fighting order. When it wasn't used in that sort of scenario, as in the Falklands, some men had to make do with the pack, whilst others, of course, used Bergens of various different patterns to make up for the poor load carrying capacity and the poor design of the pack. But some men in the Falklands were nevertheless lumbered with the pack. That's a little bit of information about the pack at the start of the video here. As I say, we're going to be talking about the equipment in, in fighting order. And we'll start with that now, looking at the equipment as we have it set up on the mannequin here. So this mannequin is set up to represent a British soldier circa 1959-1960 newly equipped with the very first issue of 1958 pattern. The uniform is the Korean War vintage combat uniform, the combat sateen smock, the wool shirt underneath there, and then we have a Mark IV steel helmet with a Hessian cover and a camouflage net over the top of that. So at this time period, the British Army very much in transition, moving on to the more modern web equipment, about to introduce a standard issue combat uniform in the 1960 pattern hadn't been introduced yet, so we still have the Korean War combat uniform worn here. Obviously, in this setup, it's fairly familiar to most people. You can see the yoke here, adjustment buckles at the front here. Obviously, as I said already, the D-rings to hook the pack on, and the belt, the waist there, 
This adjusts very similarly to the previous 1937 pattern. This, it doubles back on each side, but the way that it's secured is using eyelets down the center, something taken over from US practice. And then we have the two ammunition pouches at the front here. In contrast to the more common pouches that you'll find, which are the much later production, which we will see, or somewhat later production, they're not actually that far, they were introduced uh, fairly early on in 1958 pattern service life. Uh, these are very shallow compared to the more common ammunition pouches you'll find and carrying capacity was an issue, which is why they were later expanded. They also have these stiffening pieces in the side of the lid and much as it's not really apparent on the mannequin, these do hang vertically down, but because the cape carrier has been worn at the back, which we'll see in just a minute, they're actually being pulled back. So one issue there was with, with these pouches is that when the cape carrier is not carried, they do hang straight down on the belt and can interfere with the legs, which is one reason that later pouches, as we'll see, were designed to hang at an angle Naturally, the hooks on the back were set at an angle, so they would hang away from the hips. So that's the front of the web equipment here. As I say, this is the initial issue of 1958 pattern with first issue components, and that uh, is, they're quite distinctive, these with the stiffened sides on the lid of the initial issue 1958 pattern ammunition pouches. We'll turn this around now and have a look at the back. We've moved straight on to looking at the back of the mannequin here because there's nothing to look at on the hips. The Initial issue of 1958 pattern did not include a water bottle or water bottle pouch. There was a trials water bottle which was designed to fit within the rear pouches. That's been covered in a previous video on the channel, which I'll put a, a card up to in the corner of the video here, should you wish to go and have a look at that. As I say, it wasn't until 1962, as we'll see, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, that a water bottle and pouch was introduced for the equipment around 1962. That seems to be the earliest date of bottles that exist. The rear pouches here though would remain part of the equipment right the way through. They were modified though. These have a stiffened section in the side of the lid there that would soon be deleted. And they also don't have the upper set of loops attaching them to the upright straps on the yoke here. So when the cape carrier isn't carried, these have a tendency to sag away from the body, which was somewhat uncomfortable when they're carrying hard kits such as mess tins and rations and so forth. They can dig into the back. So that was something that would be modified later on as we'll cover as we look at the other mannequins in this series. Underneath we have the cape carrier, which of course become known as the, the poncho roll, the bum roll, various different slang terms used for this, but it is called the cape carrier. And in there we have the Mark 7 ground sheet, which of course can be worn as a cape. It can be buttoned around the body and that's been covered in previous videos as well. This is a late production example in this green color. You can just see the edge of it poking out here, but otherwise very similar to that issued in the latter part of the Second World War, but the later version in, introduced during the Second World War made in green rather than tan. Still on issue at the time, um, given the name of this piece of equipment, it's assumed that that initially was the idea of this was to carry the cape. Obviously this section here is basically replacing the load carrying capacity of the 1937 pattern haversack, which we've looked at in previous videos. Lower down, carry more weight on the hips this way, it's down on the belt, you're not carrying all of this fighting load on the shoulders. The pack would sit on top of this. Not a very comfortable way of carrying it, as I say, with just straps hooked over the top of the yoke there and then hooked around to the ammunition pouches under the, under the uh, arm. Not easy to adjust to get it to really sit comfortably. It bounces around and really, for lat certainly latterly in the 1980s, we're getting into the 1980s, for the load soldiers were expected to carry at that time if they were foot slogging, it wasn't sufficient, so a piece of the equipment really lacking. But this is how the equipment was intended to be worn most of the time when it was introduced. Of course, the attentions the designers don't, you know, they often don't line up with reality. And certainly as this equipment was in use for a very long time, in the latter days, that initial intention didn't really marry up with what was expected of soldiers. You can also carry an entrenching tool at the back here, the lightweight sho shovel or the pick handle attached to this fitting up at the top here. Run down, there is a strap on the cape carrier here which will stabilize the shovel or pick handle. And then if we just peel this out here, you can see underneath the pick head can be carried in this section of the cape carrier there. You would carry one or the other of these if you were carrying an entrenching tool or carrying the shovel or the pick, that is wasn't always carried. It depends exactly on what sort of exercise or training was being undertaken. And 
as I said, I've left that off here because it does make it a little easier just to show you the fixtures and fittings on the back of the equipment there. That's an overview of the equipment as designed. We'll move on now to have a look at the next sort of mannequin along in the progression, which is looking at the very late, well, the mid to late 1960s, and there'll be some progression in the components and so forth. Looking at the second mannequin here, you'll see this looks very similar overall. Of course, we have the 1960 pattern combat uniform now, which is visually very similar to that which went before, the Korean War era combat uniform, but now manufactured and issued as a standard uniform for the British Army as a whole, as a field uniform. We have a wool shirt still at the collar there and still the Mark IV steel helmet with Hessian and Nat over the top of that, hence the very similar outlook. Moving on to talk about the web equipment, what I've tried to include here is a mix of components to show how the equipment evolved. So very briefly, uh, circa 1962, you get new ammunition pouches introduced, modified design, new rear pouches, you get the water bottle pouch introduced. And then in 1965, you get some modifications again. You get modified yoke, modified uh, cape carrier, circa 1965 this is, the exact dates and when the components changed are a little bit murky. Uh, you get new ammunition pouches again, the enlarged version. So what we have here in the late 1960s is, is a mix of the components which would have been in production for a few years to differentiate it a little bit from the mannequin we've just looked at which had all initial issue components. So talking about the ammunition pouches first, these have been modified and having the big stiffening piece removed from the side of the pouch. As I say this particular design introduced circa 1962. They're still the same depth, they still hang straight on the belt but they've been simplified and that's the initial design change is to simplify manufacture or certainly seems to have been in removing a lot of the stiffening from the sides of pouches and things like that. So we don't no longer have that, just a little webbing, triangular piece of webbing there on the side uh, in place of that big piece of uh, reinforcement and, and stiffening on the side of the lids there. Otherwise the design is essentially the same. One modification which isn't really apparent looking at this on the mannequin is the belt was slightly altered in length as well but that doesn't really affect the visual aspect of this. So what we're looking at in this video really is how the equipment changed and the way it was worn and so forth but the, the sizings of the belts did alter slightly as well. We'll move this round now and have a look at the right hand side. So moving the arm out of the way here we can see the water bottle pouch has arrived. Circa 1962 as I say that seems to be the earliest date of bottles that can be found. The initial design uses this twist lock on the lid there. It's barely big enough to take the cup and the bottle so that would be modified. The design will be modified again. I believe again in 1965 to have a strap which we'll talk about when we look at the next mannequin along. As I say, we're looking at late 1960s here, but these would still be commonly issued out, obviously. It takes a while for newer components to enter the system and actually be issued out, so we still have the earlier water bottle pouch there on the right hip. So that's something that's certainly from 1962 onwards starts to appear on web equipment is actually carrying the water bottle in its pouch there, but not part of the initial introduction of the design. And looking at the rear of the equipment here, there's not a huge amount of change, except for, again, we have the removal of the stiffening pieces from the rear pouches here. These are the second issue. As I say, the third issue seems to have been introduced in 1965, but again, you would still have the earlier types would, would predominate. Obviously, it takes a while for the new equipment to uh, be issued out. So these are second issue introduced around 1962. They lack the upper set of loops to attach them to the uprights on the yoke but they have had that stiffening piece removed from the side of the lids there to simplify them. They still have the problem of sagging away from the body, of course, and as I say, with the third issue, that would be modified, uh, the, the design would be modified to remove that problem. Underneath, we have the cape carrier again, in this instance, carrying the 1962 pattern poncho. Now, this is a second issue cape carrier, again, I believe introduced around 1965 for this particular component. This has uh, one feature which is very obviously different from the previous one, which is the introduction of this small tab on the end of this strap here. That's now riveted. Preceding designs of 1958 pattern components used a very small crimp tip in basically copying American practice, a piece of metal just crimped onto the end, as opposed to the riveted examples which have been used on all previous British web equipment, basically. The small crimp tips were found to pull off, so that was a simple modification to the design. We'll go back to the old type using the, the rivet there, just as we have there on the cape carrier. These were also modified in having an extra set of rings fitted. They closed with a quick release here, which passes through a staple and a ring. They had an extra ring fitted to allow them to carry a little bit more, given the greater carrying capacity. 
that's basically it for the cape carrier. The design is otherwise essentially the same. It clips onto the bottom here in the same manner. It clips onto the belt. There are two D-rings for it. And then it has straps passing around to attach it to the base of the ammunition pouches. So that's the cape carrier there, as I say, now carrying the 1962 pattern poncho. And a final feature to talk about very briefly here, if I just tip the helmet forward, you can perhaps see on the yoke here, we have these straps worked on to the yoke. These are the sections of webbing here. I've mentioned already that the way the pack function is to have straps pass over the top of the yoke and hook into the D-rings at the front. These were introduced to stop those straps falling off the yoke and sliding off the shoulders. So you pass the strap through this loop to stop it falling off the shoulders. Prior to this, there was a possibility and a tendency for the strap to, to ride off and bear directly on the shoulder or worse, actually slip off. So a very necessary modification of the design there. Again, introduced, I think, and the, the 1965 round of changes, if I remember correctly. But anyway, uh, certainly something that will be seen more in the late 60s and into the 1970s, although earlier yokes would still be issued out, of course, without this. You just look at the draw, depending on what you've got. To the army, it's just a yoke. It doesn't matter whether it's a newer or a later pattern or manufacturing uh, details there, that doesn't matter to the army, of course. So a lot of these older components we're looking at here would still show up later on. The ammunition pouches to a lesser degree because they tend to be replaced, obviously they were greatly enlarged, so we carry more ammunition. So there was a tendency, certainly for frontline troops, to issue out the new ammunition pouches. I've seen uh, certainly a member of the Royal Corps of Transport directing traffic in the 1980s who still had a first issue. The, the initial ones we looked at on the previous mannequin still had one of those ammunition pouches with his sterling magazine sticking out of it on his belt. So there's no hard and fast rule, though certainly with ammunition pouches later on, you tend to see the enlarged versions, which we're going to look at on the next mannequin. Okay, so we're going to jump forward now from the late 1960s to the early 1970s and a big visual change for the British Army, the introduction of camouflage uniform. So we have the DPM combat smock here, still the 1960 pattern, now made in DPM cloth. That was the initial issue. We then quickly moved on to the 1968 pattern, which would become the standard issue camouflage uniform. But as I say, early 1970s, so we still have the, the 1960 pattern in DPM here. Still with the Mark IV steel helmet, scrim net, uh, scarf worn at the neck there in this instance. Moving on to talk about the equipment, however, we have the new enlarged ammunition pouches at the front here. They're somewhat deeper. They hold more ammunition. They are now also designed to sit angled on the belt. The previous two we looked at sat vertically, sat vertically down when uh, not attached to the cape carrier at the rear, which obviously has the effect of pulling them back. These, even without the cape carrier fitted, will sit an angle on the belt away from the hips. Something that was introduced because of the issue with them hanging straight down and interfering with the soldier's legs when sitting down. This does alleviate that problem to some degree. And obviously the enlarged size of these does mean they can carry a little bit more ammunition. And again, introduced in the mid 1960s, but increasingly common going into the 1970s. And as I say, there does appear to have been an effort to issue these out to frontline troops to give them a greater ammunition carrying capacity. So you tend to see the earlier patterns in use with second line troops after this point. And as I say, there is that photograph of a, a chap in the Royal Corps of Transport in the late 1980s, still using a first issue pouch, but that's something of an anomaly by that time period. The yoke is still the second issue, there's no change there, and similarly the belt has changed over to the, the later patterns, but there's not really visual any visual difference there at all. We have this extra strap coming over the chest here, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We'll first of all look at the right hand hip and look at the newer design of water bottle pouch. So if I lift the arm out of the way here, you can see the newer design of water bottle pouch round on the hip here. No twist lock on the top, it now has the strap. As I said, I believe this had been introduced in the 1960s. But the twist lock remained very common right the way through until the end of the 1960s. You begin to see the change after then to the design with the strap. And this is a little bit greater carrying capacity as well. It is a little easier to fit the bottom of the cup into these. And that's how the production would continue on right the way through to the end of 1958 patterns use. This will become the standard water bottle pouch. Looking at the rear of the equipment here, the setup is pretty much the same as that we previously looked at. We do have a, have a slight modification to rear pouches which is something I mentioned previously. To stop them sagging away from the body as much, the design was modified to include a second set of loops at the top here and a quick release tab. These attached to the belt using a quick release system. So that was extended to include an extra loop at the top here, which just attaches it to the upright straps on the yoke and alleviates that sagging effect. So a nice little change to the design to actually improve the soldier's comfort, improve the utility of the equipment, and it works fairly well. 
really something that should have been thought about at the outset, but as I say, it, it took uh, to get to the third pattern, which is what these are, the third pattern of, of rear pouches for that modification to be introduced. Again, underneath we have the cape carrier here. This again carries the poncho, and it's again the, the second issue of the cape carrier there. There's not a huge amount more to talk about there in terms of differences, it's as we had on the previous mannequin. As the 1970s wore on, or certainly going into the 1970s, MBC kit, that is nuclear, biological and chemical protective equipment, was becoming more and more important. It was evolving from the preceding CB suit, which had been introduced in the mid to late 1960s. And as a result of that, the equipment, the way it was used, would, would be somewhat modified. And we'll talk about that when we look at the next mannequin along. There is one bit of kit I want to talk about on the mannequin, which is not technically part of the web equipment, but we'll have a look at that now. We'll move this around now and have a look at the left-hand side. So looking at the left-hand side of the mannequin here, if we lift the arm of the mannequin out of the way, we have the S6 respirator have a sack on the hip here. This is the initial issue example made in cotton canvas and webbing. It would soon be replaced in the 1970s by a nylon version, which we'll see when we look at the next mannequin. This actually hangs on its own separate shoulder strap, not particularly a functional way of doing things, but it does serve the purpose of carrying the respirator. You'll notice in the previous two mannequins we've looked at, on the previous two mannequins we've looked at, there was no respirator have a sack carried. That's a common thing to see in photographs of the 1960s, both the early and the later 1960s. Respirators not being carried except in specific circumstances. Even on exercise in Berlin, for example, men were not carrying respirators, quite common to see in photographs but into the 1970s, this would become increasingly important, the MBC training and carrying MBC kit with you. And we have an example of that here in the respirator being carried in its respirator haversack here, although the MBC suit is not being carried on this mannequin. We'll however see how it was carried in the uh, next, on the next uh, mannequin we're going to look at. So we'll move on to looking at that now. So we'll now move on to talk about the late 1970s running into the 1980s. And we now have the 1968 pattern combat uniform on the mannequin here. This is the standard issue DPM combat uniform. The preceding 1960 pattern in DPM had been something of a, a stopgap, and this was really the standard uh, DPM combat uniform, as I say, pro progressively introduced in the early 1970s and then dominated by the late 70s and into the 80s. You do see the occasional 1960 pattern still flo floating around, but very much the, not the norm by that point. Still have the Mark IV steel helmet. This particular example has been heavily scrimmed and has a DPM cover made out of a DPM hood underneath. And then we have the scrim scarf, the neck there again. The web equipment from the front here, the components are all the same as those we looked at previously with the later issue ammunition pouches on the front here, standard belt, standard later issue yoke as well. These are no longer clipped back onto the cape carrier. So you can see even with the angled hooks, these hang straighter down, they're pushed forward basically by the other components on the belt when not being pulled back by the cape carrier. You may be able to see under the arm here, we do have the hook, we'll see that probably when we move this around to look at the side, we have the hook from the cape carrier and that's being used for another purpose in this instance. So we'll move this around and have a look at the uh, left hand hip to start with on this one. Now if I move the arm out of the way, in this instance we can see the water bottle is carried on the left hip just a variation on the way the equipment is set up in this instance, as I say copied from some period photographs. We have the bottle here in its standard pouch, the later design with the strap and so forth. The cape carrier, as you can see, has been moved up. So the strap from the cape carrier, which normally hooks into the, the bottom of the ammunition pouch around here on this little ring here, is hooked into the top ring. And this is carrying the MBC suit. This is carrying the Mark III MBC suit on the back here. Not uncommon for a second cape carrier to be carried underneath, carrying the poncho to form a shelter, but uh, sometimes you just see them carried here with the MBC suit, depending on the, the exercise of the operation that's going on at the time. And then we have the rear pouches underneath. We'll move this round and we can see how this is carried on the back rather than underneath the rear pouches. Looking at the rear of the mannequin here, we can see it's fairly standard setup other than the cape carrier being carried above the rear pouches. They are still carried in standard configuration. As the 1980s drew on, it would become more common for this to be more heavily modified. One example being the substitution of these for water bottle pouches, which is something we'll see on the next mannequin along. The cape carrier itself is, as I say, carrying the MBC suit. It doesn't carry the MBC boots. They were often omitted in training scenarios because they were really not very good for moving around in. 
and wore out quickly. So the MBC suit is carried here and whether or not boots would be carried and used depending on the specific training operation or training scenario that was uh, being conducted. However, the way this is carried is of, of note, it's quite common to see in period photographs, although there are other ways of doing this. I should stress for this time period going into the 1980s, customization of kits became more and more common and the way of doing things varied more and more from soldier to soldier, sometimes from unit to unit, there were sometimes unit ways of doing things. But this is a common method seen in period photographs and that's to hook the keg carrier up to the fittings on this attachment here, which obviously is designed to carry the entrenching tool, the shovel or the pick. This was often removed as well. You sometimes see this cut off from the yoke. Obviously if wearing a Bergen, this can actually dig into the back and make it very uncomfortable and you can't use this method if that's been done, obviously. So quite an effective way of doing it though is to just splay out these two pieces of webbing here with the rings on them and hook the two clips, which normally clip up to the bottom of the belt onto those. It makes for a very comfortable way of carrying this on the back. So that's one modification we've seen at this late stage, the way the equipment's being modified to serve a purpose it wasn't initially designed for, of course. So we'll move this around now and have a look at the right-hand side. Looking at the right-hand side here, not strictly part of the web equipment, but something very much associated with it is the later nylon S6 respirator haversack there. This is, includes a belt loop, so as we have it here, it can be carried on the belt, and it's very common to see around this time period. It just simply looped onto the belt, independent of being carried on its own straps. As we see on the next mannequin, in certain situations, it was done differently. But in this particular instance, it's carried on the belt, as you can see there. Much larger haversack allows for a spare, res a spare canister to be carried for the respirator and a better layout for carrying the decontamination kit in here than you had in the previous canvas and webbing example, which we saw on the preceding mannequin. So that's the equipment worn here for sort of late 70s into the 1980s. We'll move on now to have a look at a mannequin set up to represent troops, second line troops certainly, in the Gulf, who were still by and large using 1958 pattern web equipment. So the mannequin we're looking at here is representative of troops deployed to the Gulf in 1990-1991, and it's representative of troops of other infantry, so Royal Artillery, Royal Engineers, that sort of thing. Still using 1958 pattern web equipment. Another emblematic element of this, of course, is the mix of temperate or green DPM with desert DPM. We have the helmet cover here, still very much appropriate for the plains of Germany, but not so much uh, appropriate for the desert. So we've, has this particular individual would have received their desert DPM uniform shirt and trousers, but has not yet received a helmet cover. You can also see at the neck here, the ubiquitous Shamar, which were worn in various different colour combinations. A fairly toned down example here, which is sort of a desert tan or sand colour with, with black. Various coloured examples were worn as well. But talking more about the web equipment, this is set up quite similarly to what we looked at previously, but there are various detailed differences. One is that the respirator haversack is being carried on its own strap. You can see the base of the nylon strap just current, coming around here. We'll see that on the hip as we move this round. The ammunition pouches are still the, the third issue, the enlarged versions. There is a final version of these which doesn't really feature very heavily because it came right at the end of 1958 pattern service life. These both have fittings on the outside, the left hand one to carry the bayonet and the right hand one had a pouch initially intended to carry the Energo rifle grenade uh, adapter for the rifle which allows the self-loading rifle to fire Energo rifle grenades. Uh, that really fell out of use fairly soon after 1958 pattern had been introduced but the pouch remained on designs pretty much right to the end. The very last design of these had those features removed. They were just plain on the outside. There were no external fittings for carrying a bayonet or the pouch for carrying that rifle grenade adapter. But they weren't pr uh, predominant or prevalent by this point. I think they were actually introduced in the 1990s, if I remember correctly. So you have the same pouch as we had on the previous mannequin, the third issue here. Obviously a standard issue belt there, the later, later pattern of yoke, a, another detail to point out here is the uh, small joint services dressing taped up onto the yoke here, a very common thing to see in the Gulf and latterly in British Army of the Rhine as well. So that's the equipment looking at the front here. We'll move this around now and have a look at the right hand side. Looking at the right hand side of the mannequin here, you can see, I don't really need to lift this out of the way, but we have a water bottle pouch here carrying a water bottle. We have another water bottle pouch here carrying miscellaneous bits and pieces. Generally in the Gulf, men were issued two water bottles, so you'd have another water bottle in one of the pouches. 
you'll see there's a whole string of water bottle pouches around the back here. We'll move around, move this around now to have a look at the back to uh, show you that. So looking at the back of the mannequin here, we can see the string of water bottle pouches all the way around the back here, replacing the rear pouches. Above those, we have the cape carrier. This is now carrying the Mark IV MBC suit, which is in the same DPM as the helmet cover, basically temperate DPM or green DPM if you want to uh, just differentiate it from the desert DPM. These were also made in desert DPM, but they were in short supply, so we have one designed more for uh, wooded uh, country than, than the desert here carried in the cape carrier there. So this is a slightly later design of NBC suit, but being carried in the same manner as we saw on the previous mannequin. And then we have the NBC boots strapped up to the top here using bungees. And this is not clipped up to the fitting for the entrenching tool of the shovel or pick on the back of the uh, yoke there, as you can see in this instance. This is just bungeed on around the belt using the uh, bungees, which are also attaching the boots here. And again, it's clipped round to the top of the ammunition pouches as we saw previously. So that's the way this bundle of MBC clothing is carried on the back here, uh, is in the cape carrier and then strapped to the top of it using bungees. A very common expedient to see in the Gulf at this time period. It gives a, a nice, there's lots of nice clear photographs, of course. Uh, the press were very interested in what was going on out there. There were military photographers and so forth. So there's plenty of good color photographs uh, with lots of detail. And this is a very common method of doing things carrying it as a, as a pack on the back here for those men who were still equipped with 1958 pattern web equipment. Of course, PLCE was slowly replacing 1958 pattern at this point. The infantry were by and large equipped with PLCE, but troops such as Royal Artillery, Royal Engineers, etc. were still using 1958 pattern and indeed by and large still using the self-loading rifle, the SLR, which was being replaced by the, the SA-80, the L-85, the new assault rifle for the British Army at this time period. And finally, looking at the left hip here, we've already said that the respirator haversack has been carried on its own strap. It hangs a little bit lower below the belt there because of this. Basically, the nylon respirator haversack again, though by this time period, certainly for men deployed to the Gulf, from those I've spoken to, issued the S10, not the S6. So the S10, the most up-to-date British Army respirator at this time period. The threat of MBC attack in the Gulf was seen to be quite legitimate. There were various alarms at various points for attacks into Saudi Arabia with uh, chemical weapons and uh, men donned their MBC suits and sat around in the desert heat in their MBC suits and indeed moved through the desert wearing their MBC suits. It must have been very uncomfortable because they're bad enough uh, in uh, more temperate climes. But the threat was there and the protection was uh, was worn and obviously carried when not being worn. So we have the respirator have a sack there, the MBC suit and the MBC boots there. The haversack of course also containing the gloves, the inner and outer gloves, as well as the respirator. So there we are. I hope you found it interesting looking at this sort of timeline of equipment. As I say, looking at the equipment in fighting order, the real failing of this equipment, I certainly apart from it being made of cotton and lasting in service for so long without being replaced by something made of nylon, that's always a complaint because it gets very heavy when it's wet of course. The main complaint is the pack. It really is a terrible design not large enough and the way it attaches to the equipment is abysmal from an ergonomic point of view, the way it spreads the weight and so forth. It really was lacking in that regard, which is why I was saying in the Falklands, we looked at in the, the previous mannequin, that equipment would have been most likely supplemented by a Bergen for infantry. Although a lot of supporting troops, including Royal Engineers and so forth, had to make do with the pack, even in the Falklands. So uh, not a good design and, and definitely lacking and something that should have been more widely replaced uh, earlier on in 1958 pattern service life. As I say, this is looked at the equipment in fighting order. I might well make a part two to this, looking at the equipment in more stripped down configurations for different deployments of the British Army during the Cold War. Obviously an example being uh, out in Aden, uh, in Borneo, perhaps in Northern Ireland as well. Obviously Aden and, and Northern Ireland representing to a degree at least public order duties or certainly fighting in a more urban environment and uh, less uh, equipment needed to be carried so the equipment was often stripped down. In Borneo it was often mixed with 1944 patterns so I might make a part two looking at the use of this equipment away from its designed role which is to say armoured infantry on the plains of Europe and then latterly in the Gulf uh, to how it was used in other theatres and other uh, operations. So. That may be a part two to this. I hope you found this interesting anyway, looking through the timeline. If you have and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already.
And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, little notification button down below. That will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And, and as ever, a massive thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. I greatly appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. But that's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.